Hello, hello. I'm Jeff Cross. I'm from the Angular team at Google. And I'm Uri from uh, the Apollo team at Meteor. And uh, I just want to say, I was going to give this talk by myself originally, but Uri worked it out that he could be part of the talk. Uh, the trade-off was he had to fly in from Tel Aviv this morning at 6 a.m. So if he passes out on the stage, you know why. I'll, I'll go sit down. And he's okay. Yeah, he'll sit down. <laughs> Somebody let me know if he falls over, and I'll, I'll help just him out. Just wake me up when I'm okay. Um, so you might know this, but apps are different today. Uh, compared to five years ago, people are using mobile a lot more than they were. They have higher expectations of what apps can do. They don't want them to be just a slimmed down version like the Shopify folks just said. Uh, they want the full version. They want the full capabilities of apps now. And they want it to work well. They want it to be fast. Uh, they want it to work when networks aren't as good as, as uh, you'd like it to be. And so users have these really demanding constraints of, of what they expect now. And so as framework developers and as application developers, we've adapted to this uh, by building apps differently. So apps need more logic. They need to do more. They need to uh, be more stable and, uh, and fast. So uh, to adapt to this complexity, most applications, frameworks, and the web platform itself have been moving toward a component model. And both the talks have already talked a lot about this. Jeff's talk kind of set this up where components are, are the king of applications. It's, it's how you build apps now. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about components and data and some of the challenges and show a little bit how Angular helps you uh, get around these challenges using GraphQL. Um, so you may have heard. Uh, has anyone here heard of Angular? It's the framework that isn't React. For all this <laughs> OK. Um, good. Uh, so yeah, we've been working on it for the new version for about two years. It was a ground up rewrite, and we just released it in September as the final version of 2.0, uh, which has been really exciting. It felt like it was never going to finish, but we, we did it, and, it's, and we're really happy with what it came out to be. And one big part of it, other than being faster and simpler and a multi-platform framework, is components are the building block of applications. We had components in Angular 1 with directives, uh, but in Angular 2, they are, your, your app is a component. It's made up of other components. Everything from top to bottom is components. And so that's kind of how this is a typical way an app looks. You've got your app, and you've got some routes. And under those, you have a bunch of components that compose together to make up your views. So I think everybody probably knows these reasons why components are nice, why we've moved to them. But just to reiterate, they're reusable. You can build a component. One person on your team can build a component, and you can use it in lots of different contexts um, because they have a nice contract between parents and children. Uh, rather than having page-driven apps like we used to have where a page is controlling everything, it's getting the data, it's arranging views, listening to events, now we can break it into components that can say what they expect from the parent and also encapsulate their own behavior. So their state and behavior doesn't have to lead to the parent and vice versa. Uh, you can develop things in separation and uh, make them more maintainable. So that's nice, but they require a different way of thinking. They present some, some challenges. So let's take a look at an example app. Let's just say we have an example of, of uh, some GitHub issues that uh, are assigned to me, and I want to look through them and click on them and view them. Uh, how would we define this in Angular? This is kind of what it looks like. And I'll walk through the, the left-hand side, which is the definition of each of those rows. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we can see what the parent view would look like, where we have our header. And then we're enumerating over, uh, we're iterating over issues in our uh, parent component and creating this new child component of GH issue. And we're setting the property, of just passing in the ID of each issue so the child component can, can get that issue itself. Uh, so the first thing you'll notice about the component definition is this decorator that's attached to the GitHub issue component class. In Angular, we really believe in declarative APIs. We try to make everything as declarative as possible because, of, uh, because you can optimize uh, declarative APIs and also analyze them statically. So this lets Angular, without instantiating your component, be able to look at your components and uh, understand like what is their template, what's their selector, and do some uh, optimization around those ahead of time. So inside this decorator, we, we give the template, which is just uh, H2. And we show the title of the issue. And then we give it the CSS selector so Angular knows where to put it. And then inside here, we have this other decorator at input, which tells Angular that we expect our parent to give us this property. And we're using TypeScript and telling it that the type is expected to be a number. And this other property is expected to be a GitHub issue interface that we've defined. So we've got this simple app, but who's responsible for getting the issue data to the child component? Uh, and this is uh, still a common problem to be solved in lots of applications. So performance is one thing we need to consider. 
uh, when fetching the data in the component? Is it going to be fetching itself? What are the performance implications of that? Maintainability of the component, the child component, the parent component, the whole application, and the data consistency between the child component in this context and its parent context and any other place the same model might be used. So one way we could do it is just fetch it inside of the component. So we could change our component and add something to it. We could inject Angular's HTTP service, and in this lifecycle hook, we could say after the component's initialized, let's just get the, the, the issue from the GitHub API and, and uh, set the observable that comes back from that service on our class. And then in our template, we use Angular's async pipe, which will automatically unwrap the observable and get its title from there. And that's pretty simple. Uh, it's not much more complicated than uh, the plain component without any data. But what are some drawbacks to this approach? One is you're making an XM, uh, XML HTTP request for every item in that list. So if we had 10 items in that list, we're making 10 XHRs, and those could be blocking, uh, queuing up, waiting for the other ones to complete before the browser continues them. And we could be making redundant requests for data that's already been loaded. We don't know if this, this model has already been loaded somewhere else in the application. Uh, or if the parent even already has this model loaded. So we're making more network requests than we need to, we're using more battery than we need to, and we could have inconsistent data. So if the same issue model appears in multiple places, this is just naively fetching it. It might look different if it's changed on the server in between requests, and so um, that's a problem. I think this audience is probably already familiar with these challenges because these are some of the benefits of GraphQL. But another way we could go is to just put a service in it. So in Angular, we use services for managing a lot of state between components or anything that should be shared. This is pretty similar to the approach with HTTP. We could inject a service and just get it from our service and set that to our, our template. Uh, but uh, the problem here is there's a lot of things you need to do. You need to manage a lot of, uh, a lot of logic inside of that service. So there's some complexity of do you want to batch these requests? Do you want to cache them? How do you invalidate the cache? And uh, on top of that, there's coupling between your component and that service now. So your component is a little bit less reusable. It's, it's not so much you can just drop it and it takes care of itself. Anywhere this component needs to live, the application will also have to use that service and also stay up to date with, uh, make sure that service is provided. And uh, you couldn't really use this outside of an application if it doesn't have that service. So you couldn't make this component as an, a standalone reusable component. So let's look at another way we could do this. We could just pass the full data from the parent to the children. And here's a simple example of what that could look like. Uh, we could just set the issue title property of the component to the title because that's the only thing that the component needs right now. But this is bad because it's leaky, for one. Now the parent component needs to know what the child component needs. And if that child component ever changes its view, then the parent component, uh, any time, any context where this appears, it now has to make sure it's giving whatever other properties it needs. Uh, so it looks simple with this example because we only have one property, but once you start changing the properties, uh, then it's, it starts to become more problematic. And so it's an API maintenance burden as well for that reason, that you have to, uh, you have to maintain the, the outside and inside of the component, the parent and the child component, uh, to, to know which data is expected. And it's not safe to assume that the parent will always have the data, such as a route that would include this component may just have the ID of the issue that it wants to see, and so the parent ideally would just proxy that ID down to the component and let it handle the work instead of the parent having to fetch the data and give it to the component. So uh, with that, I want to pose maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's something that uh, can make the separation nice where we can have the components declaring what they want without having to leak to parents and without having to worry about these performance optimizations that, that we would get with writing a service. So with that, I'll ask my colleague Uri Goldstein to, to come up. Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's not a secret that we're in a GraphQL conference, so uh, you know, most of you know how GraphQL solves this problem. So today, I will try not to focus on uh, what is GraphQL and how to use it with Angular, because there's a lot, enough talks about it online, and also there's the graphql.org website, which I copy most of my slides from. Um, but I, wa I want to touch on uh, three, uh, today I want to touch on three main uh, concepts that we found out from users that use uh, Angular and GraphQL in the wild. And those three main concepts, um, how they help them build those new types of apps that they're building, and those are the three main benefits that we see when we talk to customers. Uh, so those three main, main uh, concepts are, first of all, a component-based API. The second of all is a single request per single render. 
And the third is a graphical pro uh, first approach that uh, you'll hear a lot about uh, in this conference. So I'll start with the component-based API. So I like you know, um, and here is another thing that I'm st stealing from graphql.org. Um, GraphQL has the ability to, you, with this GraphQL query, you have the ability to specify exactly what you want. You will get exactly what you need back. And those queries are actually composable. Um, so what we can do uh, that we couldn't do before, if we're thinking about the problem that Jeff proposed, is that we could break down our APIs and put those data, data dependencies inside our component. Um, and then those components can really be reusable, reusable and self-contained. So it looks, and that means that if some components changes, like one field of the component changes, then nothing else changes. Um, let's look at an example. So we have here the same uh, GitHub issue component, and right now it's, it needs just the title. So what we do, we just we query, the graph, we query from GraphQL the idea and the title. Um, and that this is this. Uh, but what happens if now we want to also add the created at uh, field? So the only place we need to change that uh, is in that component itself. So we don't need to, nothing, there's no, we, need not, we don't need to take care of a parent component, a service, or anything else. So we get really reusable um, components. The, se the second concept is uh, a single, uh, single uh, re request per single render. So if we think about, I want to stop for a second and think about why are we building those new types of apps. And I think the main, the main reason is user experience. We want, we want our apps to be fast. And with Angular, the, performance has become, the rendering performance has become amazing. But that means that the bottleneck is no longer the rendering performance. The bottleneck is the network. And I think with those types of apps, we, can, we actually can tolerate that per single render of our app will send multiple requests to the server. Like, the user experience won't be as good. So I think today, the, we have to make, uh, when we write our apps, we have to make sure that every time the, uh, the, the, our app renders a page with all of its components inside, we have to make sure that there will be just one single request uh, per render. And then if we move to another route, again, we will render again, but just with one single, simple re uh, single request because the performance are the most important thing here. And the third thing uh, is GraphQL first. So um, I'm looking at it as a, from an Angular developer perspective. I used to be a consultant in big companies, and usually what happens is that there's, uh, someone comes and we do a big rewrite. Uh, and usually what happens is that we start building our Angular components. We finish usually faster than the server, and then we wait. And then when the integration comes, it usually fails because we have no idea what we're going to get back. We have no ways to ensure it, we know, and we don't have any tools to make sure that our code that we're building actually works. But with GraphQL, we can actually, because it's a static ske analyzable schema with, with types, uh, we actually can uh, start with the schema, then the server developers and the Angular or front-end developers We'll start building their own app, apps, and we'll have all the, the, all the things that we need in order inside our IDE to make sure that the app will work when we get to the integration, including auto-completion, highlighting. Um, and those are some of the benefits of uh, statically analyzed uh, queries, which Angular is really, uh, is really doubled down on, and we're in, in the Apollo client also. Uh, you, and this example, this uh, you see here, it's actually... Uh, it's not Angular, um, but it brings me back to my uh, last point. When those three concepts, when we think about them, they are the same across, across our customers, whether they use React or Angular or any other view layer. Um, and that means that we can actually share a lot of those co concepts, and we can share not only the concepts and the best practices, but we can also share code. Uh, so how we, when we started building uh, Apollo Client, we started with, uh, we built the GitHub example, which some of you who use the Apollo Client knows. Um, and there's two versions of this example. One is Angular, and one is, is React. And when you started building that, we saw, with time, we saw that there's more and more code that we take down from the specific view layer integration, and we put it inside the Apollo Client itself. Um, and, we, and this is a, a process that happens all the time. Like we, every week, we, 
we look at the, we compare our, we compare our code with the React and Angular, and then we work together with the Angular uh, team to make sure those best practices are supported by them, and we also get feedback from the Angular team if those concepts are actually good or not. Uh, so it means that basically the main code, when you use the Apollo client, most of the code runs in Apollo client library itself, and the integration libraries are very slim. And this is, this is very important, not only because we can share code, but also we can use any view layer, most importantly, Angular 1. Today you can use with Angular 1, you can use components with Angular 1, so you can start shifting your applications, whether you use Angular 1 or Vue.js or any other view layer. So that concept feedback is very powerful that is shared between view layers and our team and also can be shared with all the other players in the industry, whether uh, whatever view layers they're using. So if you're hiring or you, do, uh, or you need to share knowledge or anything like that, then uh, it's very easy for you to move from uh, or, and to share things. Um, so the way, like a place to check out this GitHub code and how similar it is between the view layers, there's the GitHub Angular 2 and GitHub React. Uh, in uh, in our repository, and yeah. So so to uh, summarize, apps now are built component based. I think everyone has agreed on that and is building apps that way for the most part. And fast rendering is critical to user experience being uh, what they expect. And and like we said before, like we like we know already, most of our apps are actually built separately. The client is completely separate from the server. Uh, we moved to those concepts long time ago. But then it means that we need a data integration and an API that supports those concepts. So we can create a component-based API that sits inside our component. We should make sure we should, that we use the tools that make every render of the app send just one single request so the app will be faster. And in order to make this client and server uh, separate implementation fast and um, efficient, we have the GraphQL schema that gives us all the tools to do that uh, uh, today. So uh, I think the best place to check those out is at our um, Apollo Data uh, website. There's examples for any view layer out there. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be hanging around if anyone has questions or wants to say hi.